What is the theme of Ruth? Redemption. Okay. Selvin gets the first point. Redemption. And I preached like, I think about five or six messages on redemption. And even this morning we saw the skins uh, and, and they pictured the redemption through Jesus Christ. So historically, where does this book fit? What time period? Judges. What is the key to understanding the book of Judges? What? A cycle of sin, sin? punishment, repentance, repentance. Redemption. redemption, and they go back into it. But it keeps getting lower and lower and lower. And there's a key verse that helps us to understand the book of Judges. You don't have to quote it or anything, but just give me the basic idea. What is it that's important to understand? Everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. And when you, you want to know what happens if you do things which are right in your own eyes? Read the book of Judges. It's important to understand. We've got to do what God says. God's leading. And so, why did uh, Elimelech leave the promised land to go to Moab? Oh, sorry? Due to the famine, but there's something else. Because he wanted to. He did what was right in his own eyes. Where was where were the offerings supposed to be given at this time? In the tabernacle. The temple had been born, uh, born, built. Uh, excuse my mistake already. The tabernacle tabernacle hadn't been built. Or sorry, the the uh, temple hadn't been built, so they offered, they brought their offerings to the tabernacle. Is he going to be able to do that in Moab? No. It was the promised land to who? To Israel. To Israel. Was he a Jew? Yes. Should he be leaving the promised land? No. no. But he did that which was what? Right. Right? In his own eyes. In his own eyes. So, this is actually the third message on verse 1 but it says now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine land in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab he and his wife and his two sons so it's Bethlehem Bethlehem uh, what, what does Bethlehem mean house of bread so here he is, he's in the house of bread, and he leaves the house of bread to go to a terrible place, Moab. Now, this is different. Uh, in Judges, we read actually about a different Bethlehem. And so God says, he wants us to know the difference. This is Bethlehem, Judah. Judah. If you look at Judges chapter 19, verses 15 and 16, oh sorry, Joshua 19, we see the other uh, Bethlehem. Joshua 19, verses 15 to 16. And Ketath and Nahal and Shimron and Idola and Bethlehem, 12 cities with their villages. But verse 16 tells us, this is the inheritance of the children of Zebulun, according to their families, these cities with their villages. And so, uh, God, <coughs> God wants us to understand this. And so, he tells us which Bethlehem, because th th this is very important. Uh, now, I've given you a map without looking at it. Where is Bethlehem? Basically, it's, it's right near where? 
Look at your map. And you, in your map, you have Jebus. Jebus is the name of Jerusalem during the time of the judges. Okay? So, but after, it's called Jerusalem. So, you see, Bethlehem is just south of Jerusalem. Now, another geographic question. What is significant geographically about Jerusalem? There's something about Jerusalem that's it's quite significant geographically. Mountain. It's the highest place. And so you read they came up to Jerusalem or they went down from Jerusalem. So it's it's geographically. So it's very important. So if Bethlehem is right beside Jerusalem, about I think maybe five to seven kilometers, I can't remember off the top of my head, it's going to be pretty close to the same elevation, okay? So, um, we've got Bethlehem. Uh, let me read you this. The most attractive and significant of all the world's birthplaces. Under ordinary circumstances, a fruitful land. Remarkably well watered in comparison with other parts of Palestine. Now, do understand this. When you look at Israel today, you see years and years of God's judgment on the land. That's not what it was like in the time of the judges, okay? It was a fruitful land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. There was uh, great forests, and we even know that there was uh, lions and bears. You go to Jerusalem and you go to Israel now, and it, it's waste because that's God's judgment on the land. Okay. It's called the house of bread. This is very significant because uh, bread was the main staple. It's really uh, a modern thing to eat a lot of meat. In Bible times, they ate what? Bread. They ate bread. And this is the house of bread. This is very important. Bread is the primary and other articles of food are only accessory. So the thing that you really need is what? Bread. So Bethlehem is the place where your necessities would be met. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to Psalm 37. What is it like at the... It, at the start of the book of, of, of Ruth, what, what's happening in the land? Famine. Famine. This is important. People choose to leave because of circumstances. You don't leave God's place where he put you unless God tells you otherwise. And he led, left because of famine. No. That sounds like I should go, really, doesn't it? If you look at it from your mind. But let's look at it from the Word of God. Take your Bible and turn to Psalm 37. Yep, uh, 18, 16 to 18, or 19. Psalm 37. A little that a righteous man hath is better than riches of many. So you're better off with a little than leaving to get rich. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. Now verse 19 is actually the key one I want you to notice. They're talking about the righteous and the upright. They shall not be ashamed in evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. Did Elimech have to leave. No, no. no. He didn't follow God's leading. He said, I can't get my need met here. I'm going to go somewhere else. Could God have met his need in Bethlehem? Did God promise he would meet his need? Yes. 
But he wasn't willing to wait by faith. He said, I'm going to go, what? My way. I'm going to go my way. What a tremendous promise. The promise is very clear. He said, God said, in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. He's not only just going to feed them, he's going to feed them enough for them to be, what? Satisfied. What a tremendous promise. Not just fed, but satisfied. But the promise is conditional. Look at verse 18. What is the first condition? Verse 18. Psalm 37, verse 18. They've got to be upright. What does it mean to be upright? Righteous. Living a holy life. And the other thing is they've got to do it by faith. So Elimelech doesn't look by faith. He looks by sight. And he says, there's a famine in the land. Therefore, I'm not going to get my needs met here. I'm going to go somewhere else. That's not going to change Elimelech. So if, think about this. If the house of bread doesn't have bread, it shouldn't make you ask you the question, why? Why does the house of bread not have bread? And the answer is sin. Repentance was needed, not moving place. So <clears throat> let me read you this quote. And, 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 well, actually turn to Ezekiel. Fourteen, And so God, in Ezekiel 14, 13 to 21, God gives four uh, uh, sore judgments. And he's going to judge Israel when the land sinned grievously. And he was going to break the bre uh, staff of bread. So verse 13. Ezekiel 14, verse 13. Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then I will stretch out my hand upon it, and I will break the staff of bread thereof, and I will set a famine upon it, and I will cut off man and beast from it. Remember, God gave Israel the land. He says here, why will there be famine? What does it say? Sinneth, and not just sinneth, but sinneth grievously against God. Israel had done wicked against God, worshipped false gods. And God said, I will send what? A famine. So why is there a famine in the time of Ruth? They sin against the Lord. They sin against the Lord, worshipping false gods. Uh, verse 15 if I cause a noisome, noisome beast to pass through the land and they spoil it so that it shall be desolate that no man may pass through it because of the beast. Again, God said he was going to destroy it by beasts. And then in verse 17, and if I bring a sword upon the land uh, and say, sword go through the land and cut off man and beast from it. So sword and verse 19. Or if I will send a pestilence into the land and pour my fury upon it in blood to cut off man and beast. So we see that the, these judgments that God does on the land of Israel are because of sin. So now here's the quote. And what rendered a famine of bread more peculiarly afflicting and carrying with it a decided mark of divine judgment was that this famine was in Bethlehem. For the very name Bethlehem signifies the land or house of bread. How awful must the famine be when it carries with it a testimony that it is a divine judgment. But how infinitely more awful must a spiritual famine, not of bread and of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, we'll go back to Ruth chapter 1. Some of these names I may not pronounce correctly. Uh, you hear, you 
I study and, and one person says it's supposed to be said this way and some people say it's supposed to be said this this way. Some say Ephrata and some say Ephrata. I can't actually find out what's the right way. So as I go through this, if I pronounce it a different way than you pronounce it, we'll agree to disagree because I don't even necessarily disagree with you. I don't know. I've tried to study all this out and to be quite frank, I don't know who's right and who's wrong and how it's supposed to be pronounced. Okay? So I'm going to call it Ephrata. And now when it came to pass, when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his son, Malon, or Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. They came into the country of Moab and continued there. So I want us to consider now, uh, this is going to be kind of, I'm going to deal with uh, Bethlehem Ephrata. Uh, where was Ephrata? Well, it was, it, 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 we have to understand. Ephrata is Bethlehem. So let's go to Genesis. So we're, we're dealing with Bethlehem, Judah, but it's also called uh, Bethlehem uh, and, and Ephrata. And uh, so let's go back to Genesis 35. We're doing a bit of geography. By the way, you'd be surprised how much in the Bible there's geography. When you read about towns and cities and everything, and when you know this, it helps you to understand it. So now we're going to learn that that uh, where do we find Ephrata first? Does anybody know what, what where we first come across it? Obviously in Genesis, because I'm sending you there. Rachel, Rachel that's it. Okay, did, were, did you read the verse or did you know? Yeah, the verse, okay. <laughs> I was very impressed. Okay. <clears throat> In Genesis 35, verse 15, And Jacob called the place where God spake with him Bethel. And he journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrata. And Rachel travailed there, and she had hard labor. And so uh, uh, Benjamin was born there, and Rachel died there. Uh, verse 19, and Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrata, Ephrata, which is Bethlehem. So now we learn from verse 19 that Ephrata is Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Tells us the same thing uh, uh, in, in um, Genesis 48. Verse 7. And as for me, when I came from Pandan, uh, Pandan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way when there was yet a little way to come to Ephra, Ephrath. And I buried her there by the way, in the way of Ephrath, the same is Bethlehem. So now, so we understand now, Bethlehem is just south of Jabus, which is what is Jabus? Jerusalem. Why? Why on this map is it called Jabus? That was the name in the time of judges. So now, this helps us to date when uh, <clears throat> Ruth was written. Was Ruth written during the time of judges? Maybe at the end. Why? Because it's not called in the Bible in judges. It's not called Jebus, it's called Jebus. Jerusalem. So by the time, uh, it's a little bit later in, in, than the early part of the book of Judges. You, you see that? Uh, it was written, and it, there's some other things that we will find out uh, is, that explain that. Okay, so Bethlehem is about six miles, which is like uh, nine, nine and a half kilometers, ten kilometers south of Jerusalem. And it's on a range of hills. Now, the, the famine is real, right? The famine is real. 
So what should happen? Why did God... Okay, we know God brought the famine in judgment, but what, what was God's purpose? Go ahead, mention love. To turn people to repentance. That's what God wanted. So, if, if there's a famine, turn in repentance. And so there's real shortage, the real uh, trial... But God was more real than the shortage and the trial. And what they needed to do is turn to God. Not find a new place to live. I didn't get my needs met here. I'm moving. Well, find out, why don't I get my needs met here? Oh, there's sin in the land. What should I do? Repent. Because I'm in Bethlehem. The house of bread. Let me read you this quote. Instead of crying to God and trusting in Him, along with their brethren in Bethlehem, they proceeded to the enemy's land, where heathen worship false gods, and their emigration testifies to a decrease in faith. Here it is not, as the case in Abraham, to go a land where I will show thee, but rather it must be said they went to a land that God had rejected. The result was such as might be as be expected. God did not bless their departure, and therefore their entrance brought no joy. They sought to avoid one affliction and fell into a heavier one. The men escaped famine, but dearth overtook them. They had not trusted God's love at home, and so his judgment smote them abroad. Results like these must be contemplated by many who undertake to emigrate in our days. Uh, not as Abraham went to Canaan, but or Jacob to Egypt. The majority follow in the steps of Elimelech. He says, furthermore, most of those that went in these days, uh, the, it, most of those in these, most of those who in these days seize the pilgrim staff are not driven by distress. It is not hunger after bread or want that urges them, but hunger after gain and want of life. In God, so they lack life in God, and they're just looking for gain. So we've got <clears throat> in our map here. So remember, uh, this one's marked even more. Okay, so bottom of the Dead Sea, forty-five degrees that way, forty-five degrees that way you have this land of Edomites. Then, all the way up to the river Arnon is the land of the Moabites. So, it's only like 75 kilometers line of sight, but to get there, they would have to travel about 120 kilometers, okay? So, 75 kilometers away, about a week's journey. Now, think about this. They are in the land of bread, and there is no bread. And in Moab, there's bread. Moab was a heathen nation. Worshipped heathen gods. Should that not have made them realize something's not right here? What do you think? God brought the famine to bring them to spiritual realization of their sin so that they would repent. Not so that they would move away. <laughs> Moab means nothingness or waste. And how did... Lo uh, uh, sorry, I answered it. <laughs> how did Moab come about? Nobody heard me? No. Lot. Oh, you heard me. <laughs> the incestuous relationship of Lot with his daughters when they got him drunk. Do you think that's a place that a, the man of God should be going to? No. Let me read you this. The fact that the Gentile Moabites were enjoying sufficient rainfall while Israel suffered drought is a testament to God's judgment on his people, brought on by their shocking immorality in the days of judges. Now, 
I'm going to talk about something, but I'll, I'll deal with it later. Moab was cursed. Look at Deuteronomy 23. Verses 3 to 6. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation. They shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever, because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord God loveth thee. Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all the days forever. Now, I'm going to say this. They are cursed. It doesn't mean that a Moabite couldn't be saved. Okay? I'll, I'll deal with this another time. It, can't, it has to do with running. Uh, the country and, and, and things like that, they would have to... Uh, I, I won't go, I'll go into that later, but just say this. It's obviously that they could be saved because we have the book of Ruth. Amen? That's kind of obvious, isn't it? Was Ruth a saved woman? Yes. Without a doubt. And she is in the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? So I, I just want to say that. I'll, I'll deal with this uh, not entering into the congregation of the Lord later. But I do want you to see that... Uh, uh, they wouldn't be, it's not a place that God wants them going to. Pretty clear, right? So, Elimelech is doing what he thinks is right. He looks at it, he says, okay, here I am, I've got a wife, I've got two sons, I've got to look after them, there, uh, there's no bread here, and in Moab there's bread, therefore I'm moving. Logically, it looks right. Spiritually, it's from Satan, which, because he's following his own flesh. He's doing that which is right in what? His, eyes. his, his own eyes. And uh, let me read you this. The land of Moab seemed to have been exceptional riches and fertility, as allusioned in the threats of Isaiah 16 and Jeremiah 38 indicate. It was divided from the land of Israel by the Dead Sea uh, and on the north river of the river Arnon, an old boundary between the Moabite and the Ammonites. Now, why Moab? There's a number of reasons why he chose Moab. By the way, what was right here? Just right there in the map. Ephraim, Manasseh, sorry, two and a half tribes, they've gone from me. And the half tribe of Manasseh, and Ephraim, and uh, anyways, uh, remember not all the tribes got on the, yeah, some of them were on the other side of Jordan. There could have been food there, couldn't there? They didn't go there. All up there. They didn't go there either. Why did they choose Moab? Well, I, I have an idea. And I'm not saying this is right, but I think. Where is, um, elevation-wise, where is Bethlehem? It's up almost at the top. And if you look to the east and the south, you know what you're looking at? Moab. You could see Moab from Jerusalem. You could see Moab from Bethlehem. So here he is, here in his land, he's looking around and he sees famine. And he looks around and he says, Oh, the grass is greener over there. I'm going to where the grass is greener. The just shall live by faith, not by what? 
sight. It looked good to him, but it was the wrong thing. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And so let me read you this. This is Guy Kaufman. I don't know who Kaufman is, but he says, The scene for this narrative is the high plateau east of the Dead Sea and south of the Arnon River. That's uh, Bethlehem. Some 60 miles from Bethlehem. Uh, sorry, uh, that's Moab. I'll start again. The scene for this narrative is the high plateau in the east of the Dead Sea and the south of the Aran River, some 60 miles from Bethlehem. On a clear day, it was vis visible from Bethlehem. Bethlehem was the birthplace of King David and of our Lord Jesus Christ and is located six or seven miles south of Jerusalem. So he's saying on a clear day, you could see Moab. And on a clear day, Elimelech is looking to Moab where he should have been looking to where should he be looking to? The to the Lord. He did that which is right in his own eyes. You know what he did? He had the lust of the eyes. The Bible warns us of the lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. Eve, when, he, when, she saw, when the woman saw the tree, it was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, gave also her husband with her, and he did eat. Uh, what did Eve do? She saw it, and she says, okay, I'm going to do what I think I want. Elimelech looked over, and he said, okay, I'm looking over there. Moab's awful green looking. I think I'm going to go there. But he did. David got into trouble. Looked at Bathsheba. It came past in the evening time. David rose off his bed and walked upon the king's roof, the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful. Remember when they were going into the promised land. And that wasn't so earlier. They came into the promised land. What happened when they came into the promised land? What did they first do? They conquered. Where? Jericho. They conquered Jericho. But what happened when they conquered Jericho? A man by the name of? Achan. Everything was supposed to go to God. And Achan his took. And, and, and uh, then they went to de defeat a little town called Ai. <coughs> and they were defeated because of sin. And Achan gives his uh, confession. He says, I, call, I saw, I coveted, I took, I hid. I won't go through that, but he saw what about Lot? How did Lot end up in Sodom? And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plains of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zoar. When Lot didn't pray, Lord, what, what area do you want me to go? He said, what did he do? He looked. And so uh, we look to the Lord for God's will, not for what looks good. Because Moab was the enemy. In Joshua 24, then Badak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse him. We know the history. Understand this. Elimelech knew the history. This, this thing that happened with Moab and, and uh, uh, with Balaam wanting to curse didn't happen that long earlier. And yet he was willing to go there. When you start doing things that are right in your own eyes, you go down very, very low. Could you imagine going to Moab? In Judges chapter 3. Well, in that book, didn't that when Ruth happened in the book of Judges? Listen to Judges chapter 3. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Elon, king of Moab, against Israel. Because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Eglon, sorry, uh, fought against Israel, king of Moab. Could you imagine going to the enemy, to where there's your enemy, worshiping false gods? Why? Because you do that which is right in your own eyes. 
Uh, let me read you Matthew Henry. If he had made inquiry, it's probably he could have found some plenty in the, some of the tribes of Israel. For instance, on the other side of the Jordan, that bordered on the land of Moab. If he had the zeal for God and worship, and that his affliction for his brethren, which became an Israelite, he would have persuaded himself so easily. Uh, if he had affection for his brethren, which came became an Israelite, he would not have persuaded himself so easily to go and sojourn among the Moabites. You see, he didn't care about his brethren. Who did he care about? Himself. He could have been a testimony for his brethren, couldn't he? He could have said, I'm staying here because God will look after me. We've done wrong. Let's repent. Let's get right because God will look after us. Right? What a testimony that would have been. But he said, no, I'm going to do it my way and I'm just going to go. And uh, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And basically that was what's going on. Now, I want you to read Ruth 1, verse 21. And tell me, is there anything that strikes you there? Ruth 1, 21. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Is there anything that strikes you there? That the Lord testified against her? I'm sorry, you have to speak a little bit. Uh, that the Lord testified against her? Yeah, that's, that's it. But that's not what, you, what I'm looking for. Something really striking here that we've been talking about. She went out full. In the famine, they still had plenty. Right? Did you get that? Did she, they had what they needed, but they weren't satisfied. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. But, verse 21, she says, I went out full. Excellent. You get another point. They went out full. They didn't even actually have a need. They thought they would have a need. Wow. Isn't that something? Others stayed in the land. They were from the tribe of Judah, right? Let me ask you a question. Did the tribe of Judah starve to death and all of them die? No. Would have they been, would have been, would they have been just fine in the land of Judah, Bethlehem, if they'd stayed? Yes, they had enough, but they weren't satisfied with what they had, and they wanted something different. Paul said, "Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content." Lord, I'm content in Bethlehem. I know there's a famine here. You've given me enough. You look after me. But that's not what he said, is it? And in his rush to leave, he caused a lot of problems. And uh, so, anyways, next week, we are going to finish verse 1. But I hope this has helped you along the way. Let's close in a word of prayer.